Thank you, John. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you see me? I know I'm too short. I wish I have somewhere to climb. They can't see me. See, I told you they can't see me. Can you see me? Really? Hmm. Can you see my head? You can't see my body. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, boy. John, what have you done to me? <laughs> now I don't know what to say. Oh, well. It's okay. Thank you very much for uh, making this trip possible, John. I mean, uh, it's been almost a year since you've been... Uh, running after me and uh, you finally got me and happy to be here and uh thank you the, to the wonderful woman that john chose for me to stay with first when i get the email saying that oh you're gonna stay with a wonderful lady i was like, oh, i don't know i don't even know where this country is located i, I always thought that it's Sorry to say that, but you guys with Australia is together. <laughs> so I always tell people that I'm going to Australia. Yeah, so anyway, but uh, it was a little bit of uh, a mixed up on myself, but uh, I'm happy and I'm very grateful to where I end up, which is uh, Jean. And uh, I apologize again, Jean, for keep calling you Jenny, I don't know why, but um, so I'm like, okay, it's Jean, Jean, Jean and Jane, what's the difference? Oh, wow. Well. Anyway, um, thank you very much for opening your home for me. Uh, it's lovely, and uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you so much, all of you, for making my trip possible here and uh, this wonderful event. I, uh, I cannot be any more grateful than I am already. Thank you. I hope um, whatever I'm going to say here tonight will stay with you. I mean, might not be forever, but for a very long time, and uh, that it will be mean, meaningful to you, and uh, you'll go home and share it with your family and friends. Um. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my uh, background. First of all, my name is Maria Atu Kamara. I know some people pronounce it uh, a little bit awkward, which is okay by me. I said, go by Maria. If the T you cannot connect, then put Maria. It's easy. So um, I know I don't know why my parents gave me that name, but it doesn't have any meaning. Sorry. Um, I came from a very tiny country. Well, maybe it's a little bit bigger than yours because your population is how much? Four point how many million? Well, mine now is uh, 6.5 million. So we're a little bit in population maybe. Um, so uh, Sierra Leone is a very tiny country in the west side of Africa. I don't know how many of you here have heard or know about it. Uh, it's, it should be one of the loveliest country in the world, but unfortunately it's one of, now it's one of the, the worst and poorest country in the world. And uh, it's just bad. And uh, growing, uh, having to be born there and grow up there a little bit, it was uh, a little bit of a headache. But, um, you know, I'm grateful that I, I am in a country now where I found um, peace and happiness, and uh, that's all everybody could ever ask for. Every so often, there's a great story that has that get to be told. Some stories are sad, while others have happy endings. Some stories are depressing, while others are inspirational. Some stories are confusing while others are enlightening. Some stories are epic and endure, while others are brief and tragic. We all have heard stories 
we all have stories to tell. My name is Maria Tukamara, and this is my story. I was born and raised in a, in a village where I spent most of my time there being a child, doing childish things. I had, I had no big dreams, no ambitions. I had no worries, no regrets. I was a typical village girl with no knowledge of city life or outside of outside world. The only <clears throat> sorry, my throat. The only lights I knew were burning fire, the stars, and the moon in the the skies at night. The sun took care of the day. We had no running water except the flowing of the river. We, sorry, this is a little embarrassing, but I'm going to say it. We relieved ourselves among the bushes with no shame. Life was very simple, and mine was one big, happy extensive, which turned with the season. The, raining, the rains would come and go. We would plant and harvest. The trees will turn green, then brown. Then the leaves will fall off. Winter will visit, and we will find comfort around fire pits. We found <clears throat> shelter around blazing sun under trees or wherever we could find some shadow. We also played in the river to cool off. Life as a child in the village was more play and a little bit of work here and there. It was a carefree life. I enjoyed all its, its seasons until the war broke out and the rebels came. Then just like that, my life changed never to be the same. We heard from the silent whispers around the adults that the country was at war. The looks on their faces spilled terror, but as a child, I had no idea what a war was. The spoke of the soldiers and the rebels. Somehow, I had a, a knowledge of what soldiers might look like, but I had no clue what a rebel would look like. If it was an animal, I had never seen it in our village or the bushes. But the adults spoke as though this creature was, too, was to be feared a lot. I did not imagine that this creature was human. And in many cases, it was kids my own age. I find out when it was too late. The war blew the candle of my childhood and left left me burning, a burning of facing a long, hard future without the use of my hands. I wonder, it wounded my spirit and killed my joy. At first, the, the, reality was, the reality of the situation was lost to me. Being a child, I thought that like any other wound, mine would heal with time. I did not understand that then that I, wa that I would carry a permanent remainder, remainder of the ugliest of war. I would forever be labeled a victim and a survivor. And I never wished for that. When I tell and retell my story, around the world, I, marked, I make a point to offer details. A lot of those details are written in my book, The Bite of the Mango, as you heard earlier, heard about earlier, 
which is uh, one of the best seller in, uh, in North America, well, almost around the world. And it was uh, translated to uh, various languages, schools, churches, and organizations have requested that I tell and retell my story, although I do not get any pleasure in doing so. I am very willing and will not tire until every year that can be reached has been reached. I do so with the full knowledge that this is not just my story. It is a story of many silent and forgotten victims. It is the story that speaks of the ugly side of humanity. It is a story of war, rape, suffering, tears, blood, death, victims, and survivors. As ugly as it is, all looks and sounds, it is a story of endurance, hope, and forgiveness. Realizing that today I am standing before a body of believers, I declare that my story is a a sermon that inv inv invites not only our sympathies, but one that gives us hope. For a very long time, I live, I live in a state of sadness, and though I did not know it, I was constantly depressed. I had nothing to live for in life, and often wish to have died rather than lose, losing my hands. I had no idea that my, cre my creator had a purpose for me to fulfill in life. I accidentally bumped into my calling when a friend I met asked me, what have I thought, oh, what did I thought what are my thoughts of God regarding what happened to me about losing my hands? Well, the response I gave not only surprises him, but myself. The response flooded from my lips as though I had thought of it over a very long period of time. I found myself saying, I believe that God took, perhaps God took away my hands so I can touch the world with my heart. I try to do whatever I have the opportunity to do so. I knew from that moment that I had finally understood my condition and my calling. I may not touch you with my hands because there's no fingers, but I will try to reach into your heart and ask each of each one of us one of you <coughs> excuse me so follow peace with all people as christ commanded when we follow after peace we will all treat each other as equals before our our great god and help liberate the world of such evils as war, one heart at a time. For a long time, I was a very angry person, wishing harm on those who, ma who made me the way I am today. But I have, seen, I have since transformed my mind and only wish good upon those, upon those that harmed me. Christ commanded us to love our neighbors and to pray for our enemies. He forgave those who were kneeling him to the cross and died for us all. As believers, we are commanded to follow his example. I am no longer bitter as I used to. I have shared the stage with a former child soldier turned peace advocates. 
I have realized that the more I forgive, the more peaceful I become, in, become inside myself or inside me. Forgiveness works in the best interest of the forgiver. It is like natural remedy to, to a cancer of the soul. The war breaks out the darkness demons in us and the effects are still being experienced today all over Sierra Leone. I still have nightmares. Although I lived half, half a world away and I knew most of the, the other victims suffering the same, I may choose to do well on the details of the tragedies of war and the scar that remained. However, I wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about something else today. I want to talk to you about my life after the tragedy of war. I want to talk to you about hope. I want to talk to you about now and tomorrow. I want to help, I want to help all of us to forget the, the tragedy of yesterday and embrace the promises of tomorrow or the future. Through human angels, I found refuge in a beautiful place called Canada, where I now lived. I received a lot of help from well wishes, and I have come this far in life because of such help. At first, life in Canada was very, very difficult. For a rural girl who n never went to school or go to school or near speak English or understand a word. It was very frustrating. I often missed home and wished to go back. But what, when I think about it, I was, what, was, what was I going to do? And what was I going to go back to? I eventually adjusted to my new life reality and focused on making it within my new environment. A new journey I had, be had begun and I was going to travel it in spite of any difficulties. I learned the, the, I learned the language and the way of life. I went to school for the first time at the age of 15, I started school for the first time sitting in a classroom. I improved myself entering into school and keeping focus on very specific life goals. Currently, I'm in the process of completing my college degree. Soon I will be an advocate for assaulted women and children in armed conflict. That journey has not been easy. Considering that I had no formal education prior to my arrival in Canada, through hard work and determination, I have, I have come this far. I sized on the opportunities that came my way and never looked back. I did not make excuses, simply I pushed on. I refused to let my past hold me back. For me, for me, the journey into the future started when I decided to let go of the past and everything that reminded me of the war. I let go of the, the, the hatred I felt for those who maimed me. Some may consider this as a form of forgiveness. In a way it is, although no one ever came personally ask me for forgiveness, but I have forgiven them. 
Allego, Allego of the ugly memories and the feeling of hopelessness. I gave up the feeling of dependency and picked myself up. I stopped feeling sorry for myself and refused to have anyone feel sorry for me. Because as you can see, I do everything for myself. Believe it or not, you can ask Jane. Now she knows. I have a five-year-old daughter, and uh, you'll be wondering how I take care of her, but it's a miracle how it works. I don't even know how I do it, but I do it. Trust me. I might even do it better than you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> what happened to me and to, those, to the rest of most never ever we should never ever be repeat it should never ever be repeated again but it must never be used as an excuse not to pursue any goals in life so those in position in possessions positions sorry of power and influence i say we must create opportunity that help improve the lives of all victims the church occupies such a place and must speak out loud, loudly through voice and projects that bring an awareness to regions that are very unstable and prone to slide into conflict. If the church fails on this goal, then it extends as the voice of faith, and reason is se severely put into jeopardy. The church speaks on behalf of Christ, and Christ told his followers that he was living. He was leaving his peace with them before he returned to his father. It is this peace that must move us forward as we spread the good news of peace to all people and all races in all regions. Most of the time, the victims are not looking for handouts and projects that enable us to better ourselves and be self-reliant. At times, all that is needed is a word of insurance that the world understands and promises to never accept policies and practices that makes us enemies of each other. We are one big family, and most, we, we must treat each other as brothers and sisters and seek to bring out the, the better angels in all of us. We must never, ever answer the call to pick up weapons and go to war and against one another. It is time to make sure we create a, a brighter future for those who will come after us. And we can begin by rejecting the practices of past of the past and anything that seeks to, seeks to take us back there let us all be each other's keeper finally let me let me speak directly to those who believe that they are they are too young to make a difference or too significant too significant to have their voices heard. A primary school kid des desire to help, to help is all it took for me to have a better life, opportunity to see the world and to have a lifetime. His name was Richie. He heard of our national, natural tragedy 
and he learns of my personal struggles. He convinced his parents to help me, to step in and help me. Because of that, because of the goodness of his heart, because of the goodness of his heart and his parents' heart, this, li this life has been altered and now it is my turn to carry on the example that that primary school kid set for me, for the rest of us. We all can be other. We all can be another. In various ways, we all can do our best to help. We all can lend a helping hand. We all can do our little best to convince the adults to step in and make a difference. Every effort gets noticed and rewarded one way or the other. So let us keep trying and make a difference, effort by effort, for those who are suffering out there. Let us take an ad advantage of every opportunity to make a difference, and let us always remember to make wise decisions or choices in life. The choice I made get me where I am today. So many victims, so many people, kids that get their hands amputated in Sierra Leone. And some decided to end their lives, which I know. And some never have the opportunity that I have to come to Canada or to the United States. There's a few there. And this is the reason why a few years back, uh, ago, I decided to, to start a project for those people. Since they never have this opportunity to come to where I am today, I want to go back and help them. And I, th I, I thought of a lot of things, what can I do? I mean, I can't help them themselves anymore because most of them are adults now and most of them are dead. But some still have their children and their children are still there suffering. So what I've been doing in the past is that <clears throat> I've been collecting donations like used clothing, shoes, school supplies, you name them, and then ship them over with my own personal money, whatever I can get, donation, wherever, and then ship them over. And then go, I try to go at once a year, and then take them to the hospitals, um, to, the, to their camps, some of the camps are still there. And, uh, you know, when I said a camp, it's not a camp like the camp you go camp here. You know, fun and all that. The camp there is miserable. The camp I lived in, it was miserable. And, you know, there's no fun about it. And I just want to go back to give a little to these people, whatever I can give. Because I can't give them everything I don't have myself. But with your own help, I believe that we can do something. Whatever little you give, trust me, you might not think that it's going to make a difference, but it's going to make a huge difference. Sierra Leone, right now today, I was just telling Jean, Jean 40 kilo of, of rice, 40 kilo, I think, yeah, 40 kilo, almost $50. Just think about it. Who is going to eat? Only the people that have. And what about the ones that doesn't have it? How are they going to manage? So some people are still on the streets begging, which that's what I was doing when I was there in the camp. I begged for nearly three years. I was in the streets begging for food, just for food, money to buy clothes, to buy food. It's sad for me when I go there and see my friends are still begging, and it breaks my heart. So... I need your help because I can't do it all by myself. But I know you're good people and uh, you can help. So um, to finish off my talk, <laughs> sorry, um, I just hope that, as I said, you all found it in, in, in your heart to help others. And let us all take the advantage of, of 
every opportunity to make a difference and let us all always remember to make a, a wise choice as i said mentioned earlier i think i did i said it already let us hold our leaders accountable and force them to make decisions that improve our lives and ensure that there will never be another war never be new victims Never be new survivors, stories, and never be a new human in, injured, injur, injured, natural tragedy. And uh, as I'm ending my talk, I will, I don't know how many minutes we have for questions, maybe five minutes, John? Oh, wow, well, we're going to be here the whole night because I like talking. <laughs> no, okay, I'll give you t maybe 10, 15. Oh, 10 minutes is fine. So, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, I just, uh, I guess I'll open the floor and I uh, just want to say that, remember, our friends always say that where there's a life, there's always hope. Or where there's a hope, there's always life. Should I? It's the other way around. So remember, if you're out there complaining about little things, just think about Maria too. She doesn't have hands, but she can do it. I can comb my hair. I can do my makeup. I can do my shoes and my dress and everything. And I can cook. I love cooking. I love food. I love cooking. So I cook. I take care of my house. And trust me, it's hard to believe, right? I know. <laughs> Don't worry. It's, it's all there. I, I know. Jenny is now. Jenny is gonna tell you about that. So, um, yeah. So remember, the books are still there, and uh, <coughs> those books are actually, um, you know, the half of it goes to uh, my project. And so, you know, so you're not just gonna throw your money, and uh, you can buy it for your friend or for a gift. Um, even Christmas, it's far from now, but it's a good gift. I'm telling you. It's a very easy book to read, and, uh, but you can get all the information you need from me in that book. And uh, again, thank you very much for giving me your attention. And uh, I'm sorry if I took a little long. And uh, thank you very much. And now it's time for questions and answers. Thank you. <laughs> all right. We need questions. Anybody with a question? Yes. You're welcome. Oh, yes. What the world was about in Sierra Leone, yeah. I know it's a little bit complicated. I, I have no right or wrong answer to what's that. Just based on what I learned. They said it was about the diamonds and, uh, you know, and I don't know if you know anything about the, the war there and uh, <clears throat> how Chastel or I don't, do you guys know about him? Anybody know about the war in Sierra Leone? I guess not. Okay. Yeah. Well, this uh, powerful man I will call, I wish I had finger to give a, uh, whatever. Um, came to Sierra Leone, which what I learned, and uh, corrupt our people because uh, he came and um, convinced them to go into war, and uh, so that they will be able to get the the the, <coughs> the get into power because they're trying to. Uh, get the person who was in power so the, the they can get into power those those bad people and so this uh, Charles Taylor which is the Liberian uh, rebel leader came to Sierra Leone and, and joined guns or whatever he bring the guns to these people and give them the gun and said okay you give me the diamonds I'll give you the gun and so that you can fight those people and get them off the, the uh, power and then you can get in and so that's how I learned, that's what, that's what I learned, is that that's how the war started. It was not about religion, not at all, 
or even uh, tribalism. No, it wasn't like that. It was think about the war and power and whatever. And it's bad. You know, the worst thing is, is too much corruption. It's, it's, uh, that is what is uh, destroying Sierra Leone. And, uh, you know, it's very corrupt there. Very corrupt, trust me. Yes? What's the thing? Sorry, I didn't get the question correct. Mm. Oh, you mean? <coughs> oh, well. I, for me, what I <laughs> what I've been doing in the past few years, I just ship whatever I gather. Like as I said, use clothes and uh, you know um, school supplies and uh, food and all sorts of stuff. I just put everything in barrels. I don't know if you know barrels, barrels. Yeah, that's where I pack them and then ship them off and then so just donate them when I go there. And it's amazing how. People are, you know, going crazy about those things that we take for granted here and, you know, North America especially. I don't know about here, sorry, but North America, we take a lot of things there for granted. Like we waste food and, uh, you know, it's all they care about, you know, the new brown iPhone and, uh, you know, computer and all those sorts of things. We didn't have those. And many people don't even know what a phone is. I didn't know... <laughs> I didn't know what a shoe, I didn't wear shoes until, if you see me today with shoes, a lot of shoes, it's because now I came to a place where, you know, I have opportunity to have shoes. I didn't wear shoes until the age of eight years old. Never wear shoes. I was just walking on the, the ground with my uh, bare feet and, uh, you know, it's still, you know, going in and thinking that, oh, I have the best life, you know, because that's the only life I knew, you know. So, and so many kids are still there who doesn't, you know, have the opportunity to have shoes or even go to school. It's still there, especially in my village. It's, it's just terrible. But uh, I hope things get better someday. Um, I saw somebody wanted to ask a question. Yes? <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah. Oh, the child soldiers. Well, yeah, there was uh, a lot of them. So a lot of those uh, kids were turned into, you know, to uh, monsters, I would say. And, uh, you know, I came to understand that those kids were... They were, it was not their wish to be who they are, you know. They were taken from their parents. Their parents, some of their parents were killed in front of the, the, the kids, and the kids were taken away and been given guns and drugs, uh, give them drugs and all sorts of, you know, drugs that you can think of to make somebody go crazy and do bad stuff. And so those kids become monsters, you know, even seeing their own family or their own friends, they see them as an animal. So, you know, the ones that cut off my hands were not even much older than I was either. They were from 10 to 15 or whatever, or 18. Very little kids, very little kids, you know. It was terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, there is. Well, there is. Well, I'm not uh, talking about the violence because after the war, I haven't seen 
much violence yet, or maybe because I haven't been there for long. I've been, I left since 2003, so I just, I go once, once a year for the past four years. I've been going once a year, so I can't tell much, you know, only people that live there constantly that can tell you, you know, but uh, for the mental problem, yes, it's there, because when I go there, I can see them. I can see, you know, they, some of them are just going nuts and walking down the streets, talking to themselves and, you know, with no clothes on and, you know, just dancing off the streets. And you can tell that those are the ones that have been dis destroyed before. And, you know, now they're adults, for sure. And, uh, but the damage is still there. Yeah. Um, nobody was in the back. Yes. Pa pardon me? Yeah, no, no. Actually, I was uh, I was born in a Muslim family, and uh, you know, but we're not we're not those strict people. We're very open. That's just the the fact, and. Uh, Never wear hijab or, <laughs> or anything like that. I never uh, pray my five daily prayers, which is required to do, but I don't. Um, because I just believe in God. I believe in God. And uh, my grandmother usually used to tell me that, you know, whatever happens in life happens for a reason. God has reason for everything that happens in your life. So, um, so I believe in that. And, uh, you know, you know, we grow up talking about God, how, you know, God is great and all that. But, you know, we're not typical or whatever, you know. But, uh, yeah, I I, believe I had the God word since I was uh, little. I've been hearing about it. Yeah. Come on, uh, guys, I'm going to call names. Yeah. Um, well, this time, um, it was terrible, actually, um, because I'm going to share a personal story, which is in the book, and I, I, I tend to just sometimes put it behind me, but I'm going to share that since you asked about the baking. Um, you know, I was, I was, uh, going to be give away to married at the age of 10. Yes. So, at the age of 11, this man, because I keep refusing and uh, whatever it is, so at the age of 11, when the war finally in our own side, and, uh, you know, this uh, guy, because we used to run from, from the village to the bushes, we, s we slept in the bushes so many days, so many weeks, so many months. In the bush, not just a camp. It's not a camp bush. I mean, empty bush just lay down there for, for weeks and months. And so um, this guy took advantage of the, the, the running opportunity or whatever you call it. And so I get raped by him at the age of 11. So, yeah, it's terrible. Sorry, I don't want to, that's why I don't want to talk about it. And so, um, right after then, a month or two months, months later, or two months later, I believe that's when the rebels attack. And so, when, after my hands were cut off, I was in the hospital, that's when uh, the, they discovered in the hospital that I, I was pregnant, 11 years old pregnant, yeah. So anyway, um, so my uh, aunt, I begged, begged, begged. I said, please, either I die or I, I can't carry this uh, pregnancy because I didn't even know what it was or whatever. But, you know, so, and uh, my aunt said, uh, that time my parents was not around, was my aunt. And she said, you know, um, the religion does not allow that, and so we're not gonna, I'm not going to give consent to that. And so to do abortion. So I said, okay, 
But to be honest, I nearly killed myself in the hospital, but she caught me on time. And so, um, so after the hospital, I went to the camp. You know, my belly was big, and uh, I don't know where I was going. Um, so after during that time, you know, people seeing a kid with a big belly, they probably thought hey, it's a, it's sickness. It's not a sickness. So I get when I go to the town to beg, people. I guess tend to be more sympathetic, or should I say? So I get more money than the other people, and <laughs> and so after the baby, I I had to go through a lot of uh, things, you know, uh, operation to the, for the baby and all that. And so after that, we started going to me and my cousins. We started going to the town again for baking. And uh, I have to hold the baby with the, the lady that was helping me, my auntie that was helping me with the baby. And so when they see, when the people see me with the baby and they'll be like, oh, look at that. That's sad. And so, well, I don't know what they're really thinking. So, you know, I get more money. I get more food. I get more little stuff that, that anybody else. So it was good. The baking was good. It wasn't pleasure. I didn't like it. I didn't want to do it, but I have to because I didn't have a choice. And that's how, um, you know, doing that, going to the town, the place was dirty, in the camp, filthy, and, uh, and the kid gets sick and uh, with uh, malnutrition, and he died at the, at the age of seven to eight months. So, yeah, so that was the end of it. But part of me, I was kind of relieved because I'm like, I don't know what, what I'm going to do with this baby. I didn't have any love for him. I didn't have any, you know, passion for this person. And it was just confusing. So, but, you know, God took him and said, you know what? I guess that's what I thought that God sees or God knows that I did not want that child. I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, if you were in my shoe, you understand what I'm trying to say. And God took him and I said, okay, that's fine. And, uh, yeah, but the baking was, wasn't easy. It was it's a hell. Some people will not give you, but they will still say something, you know, say a word. And, you know, it was just too painful. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Pardon me? Oh, how did I manage to uh, come to Canada? Well, um, uh, this little boy that I read about in the, in the speech, as I mentioned him, and uh, his name, name was Richie, and uh, he, he actually passed away many years ago. Um, he, uh, his dad picked up my story on the newspaper there in Canada. I don't know how it's get there, trust me. So um, he saw the, 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 the story and said, okay, dad, you know, since you promised me before that you would do anything to make me happy. He said, well, this is one of the things that I want you to do for me, to help this little girl to come to Canada and get a better life. And... He did, and they, they brought me after two years later. Yeah, that's how I get to Canada. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Don't wait later. Mm. No? Okay, you're going to be here tomorrow too? All right. No? Ah, the books are there. Oh, the, le the books lady is there. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much again for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you.